Welcome, everybody, to the many, many parliamentarians who are joining us for this very, very special event on peace and democracy. Can ballots replace bullets? My name is Claire Dool, and I'm your moderator. A few housekeeping points to begin. There is interpretation in French. We'd also very much like you to ask questions, so please do ask questions using the chat function. And later in the discussion, if you would like to ask a question, then please use the digital hand and we will invite you to take the floor. Of course, we do want you to use hashtag IPU and hashtag democracy hyphen day for all your social media posts. We have some fantastic speakers on peace and democracy and how we reinforce peace and democracy. But before I introduce them, the president of the Interparliamentary Union, Tulia Axon, has this video message for us. Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I address you today in the week that bridges two very special days for the Interparliamentary Union and indeed the global parliamentary community. First, the International Day of Democracy, which is celebrated on 15th September, and the International Day of Peace, which is celebrated on 21st September. Democracy and peace are the two pillars on which the IPU stands tall and proud. Time and again, history has shown us the deep connection between peace and democracy. This year, more than ever, with more countries at war or in conflict than at any time since the end of World War II, it's never been truer to say that Peace cannot be sustained without democracy, and democracy cannot flourish without peace. The essence of democracy is its ability to create a space with parliaments at heart, where every voice can be heard, where every person feels represented. This inclusive nature of democracy is, in itself, conducive to peace, reconciling people through dialogue rather than encouraging violence. In turn, peace provides the necessary stability for democratic institutions to function properly, enabling nations to become stronger, more resilient, and more equitable. But let us acknowledge building peace and democracy is not an easy task. They must develop from within, rooted in the traditions and local realities of each society. And we, parliamentarians, have a key role to play to build and support strong institutions, to uphold the rule of law, and to protect the rights of all citizens. True, peace and democracy can only grow when people feel secure, both individually and collectively. By developing our parliamentary democracies, we are also promoting our own peace for our own people and that of our neighbors. Only in this way can we achieve a more stable, just, and peaceful world. Dear colleagues and friends, happy International Day of Democracy. Happy International Day of Peace. Thank you. As we heard from the president, peace cannot be sustained without democracy, and democracy cannot flourish without peace. Democratic peace theory says that the more democratic a country is, the less likely it is to go to war with others. But we also have just heard that there are more wars and conflicts than there has ever been, or at least since World War II. So does that theory still hold true? Well, with me to discuss that and also how we're going to reinforce democracy are four experts. Let me introduce you to them. Tom Carruthers is the Director of the Democracy, Conflict and Governance Programme at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, an international affairs 
think tank. And Tom is a leading authority on democratization and international support for democracy. And he works with institutions and organizations on this. Isabel Aninat is a lawyer by training and the current Dean of the Law School of the Universidad Adolfo Ibanez in Chile. And Isabel is also the Vice Chair of the Board of Advisors of the International Institute for Democracy and Electoral Assistant. International IDEA is an intergovernmental agency that supports democracy worldwide. And Imran Ahmed, well, he's one of the few people to have been targeted in court by Elon Musk and won. More on that later, as I'm sure Imran will tell us. But he is the founder and CEO of the Center for Countering Digital Hate. As the name says, it's an NGO that works to stop the spread of online hate and disinformation. And he started the center after concerns about the rise of anti-Semitism in the UK and the death of the British MP Joe Cox by a white supremacist who had been radicalized in part online during the EU referendum back in 2016. And Imran advises politicians around the world on policy and legislation. And sitting next to me at the IPU headquarters in Geneva is a face that will be very familiar to you, uh, Martin Chungong, Secretary General of the IPU. Um, he's known for his commitment to really rejuvenating democracy, its institutions, its processes, and encouraging young people into parliaments worldwide. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Let's start with the discussion on the status of democracy. And Martin, a little bit of a definition. IPU, it's a champion of democracy. Uh, what does democracy mean uh, to the IPU? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Claire. I'm very pleased to be joining this conversation this uh, afternoon, Geneva time. And uh, for us, we uh, tend to uh, position ourselves as champions of democracy. That is our uh, business model. And uh, it's a, a simple definition for us. It's first a system of governance uh, where you have institutions interacting with one another to uh, fashion policies and implement those policies that are meant to be serving the common good. But it's also a system of values that uh, we need to promote as spouse freedom of expression, human rights, uh, the, uh, uh, I, I would say, requirement for everybody to live in peace, rule of law, all of that, things that are uh, uh, understood and espoused by the global community. When it comes to the IPU, you had the IPU president talk about parliaments as pillars of democracy. But I hasten to say that they uh, can't work in isolation. It is a multi-stakeholder endeavor. You have interaction between parliaments and the executive arms of government working together, but we increasingly are pushing for involvement of other segments of society, civil society, the media, academia, science, and uh, local communities, because it's important that all these uh, participants contribute to strengthen and enrich the outcomes of parliaments. And again, we go back to the strap line of the IPU for democracy for everyone. For us, democracy should serve and deliver on the expectations of the people. And the beauty about democracy, why we are so keen to promote democracy, is that it's self-correcting. That is, if people don't like their system of democracy or governance, they have the opportunity to change, to throw out uh, their governance and elect new ones. This is something that is not uh, rife in authoritarian regimes. So. Democracy, yes, we need democracy. Thank you, Martin. Indeed, we need democracy. As you say, democracy is self-correcting. And democracy, of course, is parliamentarians who we have at this event. We have uh, academic 
academia with uh, Isabel and Tom and civil society with Imran. Now, Isabel, International Idea is very fortuitous, but today has come out with your report, The Global Status of Democracy. Martin, of course, has just given us all the benefits of democracy, but it's not really good news, is it? We know that democracy is in decline. Can you just give us a few highlights of this year's report? Thank you, Claire, and thank you for the IPU for having me. Um, as Claire said, I'm afraid I'm not bringing the greatest news. So I'll just point out a few highlights from the report. The report is available today and you can um, access it. Just let me point out two areas. One is democracy and the other one is electoral um, challenges that we are seeing around the world. On democracy in general, what we are seeing is that countries are experiencing net declines. So um, one in four are showing uh, some improvements, but unfortunately four in nine are going back. This is, um, in other words, we are seeing some, some uh, improvements in 42 countries, but uh, we're seeing declines in 79. These are countries all over the world. They're, it's not concentrated in one region or in another. We're seeing these trends in different parts of the world. And it, what is interesting again is that it, um, we are seeing the sharpest declines in countries that have had weak institutions for a while, but we are also seeing declines in um, very established democracies. And these are due to all challenges or all topics that, such as uh, how do democracies um, deal with crime, but also for new challenges, um, AI technology, we're gonna speak about this in the panel, but also for example, climate change. Um, the report also focuses on um, elections itself. Of course, um, elections are not the only indicator for a democracy, but it's the core minimum of a democracy, right? Um, and because this is the what it's called the super electoral year, um, we wanted to put a focus on what's happening in elections. So just let me give you some highlights. Um, what we're seeing is that around the world, again, in different regions, credibility of elections um, is worse than we are seeing since 2018. So we are seeing a decline over the last um, five, six years um, in 39 countries out of 173, we have seen decline in the credibility of elections. And this goes hand in hand with what is happening in terms of challenging elections. We are seeing an increase of countries where we see um, at least one legal challenge in court of vote, vote counting or the results of elections. Um, and we have seen a high um, that is happening again and again since mid-2020. And also we're seeing that in one out of five elections, the losing candidate, be it a party or a, or a, or a person, publicly, publicly rejects the outcome of the election. And thus um, the, the idea of elections now being disputed is becoming more frequently. Again, this is concentrated not in a single part of the world, but it's a global trend. And the final thing, because there's a lot of highlights that I can go over, but then we have a short time, is that um, we are also observing, and this is very important, I think, to put um, in the table for discussion, that the global rate of participation in elections, right, has been in decline over the last um, decade. Uh, it used to be around 65% of uh, public participation in the electoral process. Now it's down to 55.2%, and that has been a trend that it's gone, has gone slowly declining over the last 15 years. So again, um, the full report is online, and we are seeing many challenges, both in democracy in general, and also um, in this special year in the electoral process.
Thank you, Isabel. It makes me think I should have said lowlights rather than highlights. I know that your report does have some recommendations and we'll move to what we can do in a moment. But let me bring in uh, Tom, also a leading authority on uh, democracy. Uh, Tom, your views on what Isabel has said, and particularly in this electoral super year, how are we, how are we faring as we're about three quarters of the year? through. Thank you, uh, Claire. I thought the International Idea Report, as it is every year, is, is accurate and a very useful snapshot of the state of democracy in the world. I'd highlight four points, Claire. First, there's been a tendency in the last year or two to look maybe almost too hard for good news and to argue that the democratic recession of the last 15 or 20 years is starting to reverse. The democracy community is exhausted in some ways by all the bad news. They're eager for good news. And there's a tendency, I think, to overemphasize positive developments in a few places, whereas the idea report in a very sober way is a useful corrective to that. Doesn't mean there aren't some good cases. Look at Bangladesh in recent months, citizens rising up to chase out an authoritarian figure. But on the whole, the, the somewhat discouraging picture that Isabel presented, I think is accurate. Second, I think it is very important to note that the increased disputation of elections, this is really an important trend. Why is it happening? I think it's happening for two reasons. First, there's just more and more polarization of political life in countries in which the opposing sides don't share any common ground, have really highly negative views of each other, treat each other as political enemies rather than opposition, and therefore elections begin to crumble in the heat of polarization. Second, there's also a tendency towards denial of reality. Politicians who try to fabricate their own reality lie incessantly. and use the changed information space, Imran will probably be talking about this in some ways, use the changed information space to propagate uh, alternative and false realities, and that increases the tendency to dispute elections. Third point, I think it is important in the bad news, nevertheless, to distinguish between what I've called in some writing I've done, tremors for democracy versus real backsliding. Not all bad news is the same. So, for example, we may be concerned in a couple of Nordic countries about the rise of far-right parties that imply a certain kind of illiberal politics. That is worrisome. But we can't compare that to, say, the coups in the Sahel in recent years that completely overturned regimes with military governments. So we need to distinguish a little bit in our backsliding menu between what I think of as really significant backsliding from simply wobbles or tremors that some countries are experiencing. And so we need to be careful as we see a cloud you know, in front of us to distinguish within the cloud the really bad news from simply warning signs. And uh, the fourth and final point I'd like to make is in that cloud, there has been a tendency to think that the main problem for democracy in the world is the rise of illiberal right-wing figures, populists in a number of countries. That has happened. I don't even need to name them, they're well known. But there's trouble for democracy in other forms that we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, one of them is the role of militaries in politics. Think of Myanmar, where a democracy movement was squelched by an overreaching military. Think about what's been happening in some South Asian countries recently, Pakistan and Thailand, where militaries are overasserting themselves in politics. And so, yes, there is a problem with far right populism in some places, but that is not a global picture or a global explanation of the trends that Isabel is talking about. Thank you, Tom. Lots to unpack there. And I think your main uh, point is, of course, the shades of grey in that there's uh, real serious backsliding. And then, as you put it very nicely, these tremors for democracy. Martin, any thoughts on what you've just heard from Tom and his analysis? And then I'll bring Imran in just to reflect on what our two democracy experts have been saying. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Claire. Just to say that I agree entirely with uh, uh, Isabel and uh, Tom regarding the state of democracy in the world. But the thing is, I'm, I am an eternal optimist. I think that democracy has the potential to fix itself. And uh, I think I mentioned the fact that it's self-correcting. It At least there's that opportunity to self-correct. And uh, if uh, people don't like uh, their governors, throw them out. Uh, Tom, you mentioned the Sahel. 
it's a region that I know very well. And um, uh, the, the people have uh, couched the military coups as, uh, in, the, in the region as something that's inimical to democracy. But when you talk to the ordinary people in the Sahel, they uh, tell you that uh, they prefer the military regime because it's delivering on their expectations in terms of access to health, in terms of access to education and uh, employment. I was in Gabon myself and I witnessed this. Uh, uh, a road that uh, the previous regime had not been able to fix for years was being repaired overnight because the military had said, let's do it. But it's a very dangerous line to tread, that of saying, oh, it's either democracy or development or access to welfare. Uh, I think uh, we need to strike the right balance there. But I, I do agree that there are a lot of challenges, but these challenges can be addressed. And uh, democracy for us is like the phoenix. It, you know, it dies, but it rises from its ashes. Thank you. I love the, the image there about democracy as a phoenix. And indeed, let's we will move on to uh, this whole point about democracy. How do we rejuvenate? And it has got the potential to correct itself. Um, Imran, um, any thoughts on what you've heard? I mean, generally, not great news, um, despite what uh, Tom says is that uh, there is an attempt to put a positive gloss on uh, democracy and, and where we are, just to get your thoughts. Uh, thank you. And just by way of warning, I have a two week old baby in my lap right now, um, which is part of the part of the problems of being a, a new dad. Uh, so if you see a hand appear, it's not mine, um, uh, unless it's a big hand. Um, look, let me, let me make a, a series of points. Let me start with this. Um, when I started looking at the problems of an increased hate polarization, the increasingly vociferous nature of our societies and in 2016 I had the benefit of seeing it happen both on the political left and the political right in the UK and I could see it happening overseas as well and what that told me was that something systemic is happening this is a it, this is not a series of one-off events which have no connection. There's an underlying cause. And what was clear to me at the time was that given that democracy itself and our system of governance are highly dependent upon a type of communication system that has things like epistemic authority coded into it um, and mechanisms for establishing the truth, which are well established, that part of the problem that we had was that the, the primary locus of information exchange, of the setting of our social mores, uh, the negotiation of our values, even the negotiation of the corpus of information that we call facts had shifted to digital spaces, and that they were run by private corporations to a set of rules that generally benefited them commercially. Let me bring the, the, the next question. What have those rules done? What has that system done? So a few years ago, Meta did a study with political parties in Europe where they asked them who likes what's happened to social to political campaigning on social media and what's it really done? What they all came back and said was positive campaigning no longer works. The only thing that gets engagement and therefore amplification is negative campaigning. And the only parties that supported that were extremist parties. Most conventional democratic parties, which operate in the normal realms of public policy, were, were finding it really difficult to communicate. And I think what that has done at a, at a, at a macro level is destabilize not just you know, individual elections. This isn't an iceberg melting here or there. This is climate change in the democracy space. This is a fundamental, profound shift in the way that democracy operates, the values that underpin democracy, the technologies and the communications protocols, the epistemic systems that we have that underpin democracy have profoundly shifted and um, the results are becoming clear. And I think part of the reason for this, and I'll go back to these being private corporations run by just a small handful of very, very wealthy men in Silicon Valley in the United States. 
fundamentally, democracies are about the voluntary acceptance that there are checks and balances on power. The separation of powers, checks and balances, these are all important. There are no unaccountable loci of power in a democracy, or there shouldn't be. But there are for social media companies. The people that administer our information ecosystem are beyond legal reproach in most jurisdictions, in particular the jurisdiction in which I'm based, in which they're based, the United States, because of Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act 1996. They are beyond regulatory reproach, and they claim to be beyond social reproach because in the most vulgar sense, they argue, it's freedom of speech, but it's not. It's about amplified algorithmic disinformation being given the advantage over good information. It's about a failure to think about mechanisms for ensuring that people who breach the rules are, face sanctions, which is something that you see in any democracy, in any society, whether democratic or not. And about ensuring that they don't poison our information ecosystem with lies, which everyone can accept on, is not a healthy thing to do. Imran, thank you. Indeed, it's almost a case study, isn't it, what's happening, as you say, in this space online. And we'll come back to you to dig a little bit deeper on that in a moment. If I move the discussion up slightly a level, because, of course, as has been said, democracy is uh, facing challenges, uh, whether that's a tremor or a storm. And what does this mean for peace, though? Because is it still the case that the more democratic a state, the less likely it is to go to war? Um, Tom, bringing you in on this nexus between democracy and uh, peace, what's, what are your thoughts there? The democratic peace theory held that if two countries are both democratic, they're very, very unlikely to fight each other. I think that still holds. The interstate conflicts that we've seen in the last 10 or 20 years, as well as I'm going to talk about civil wars in a minute, the interstate wars have all involved at least one country which is not democratic. Think of Russia and Ukraine, for example. Um, and so we shouldn't give up the democratic peace theory because war is rising. Every significant interstate war involves at least one principal actor which is not democratic. Now, I think it's also important, civil wars are also uh, on the rise, um, some really terrible civil conflicts in the world. And if we look at them, almost all of them are related to failed processes of democratization in which a military actor or some kind of strongman actor has overridden an attempted process of democratization and brought the country into war. Think of Syria, for example, and the terrible suppression of the pro-democracy movement from 10 years ago. Think of Myanmar, which seemed to be for some time on a path of democracy until the military overrode that process and shattered it. Think of Sudan, which has been in a heroic struggle for democracy, but again, military or paramilitary actors in that country have broken it. And so um, almost everywhere where we see a civil war, we see underneath it a failed democratization process. So we need to be careful. Don't blame democracy for civil war. Blame the people who are undercutting and undermining democracy for the civil wars. So we need to be careful when we see rising conflict in the world and say, what happened to our hopes for democracy and peace? Those hopes should still be there. We should focus our attention on those who are undercutting democracy rather than on democracy itself as the locus of blame. That's uh, in interesting, as you say, about the failure of the de democratic process can contribute to wars, but don't blame democracy. Martin, your thoughts? Yeah, thank you. I, let me just pick up from where Thomas left. I agree with you that we shouldn't blame democracy. Democracy as a concept, as a system of governance, is, uh, I would say, virtually unimpeachable, right? But it is the people, it is the uh, practices of democracy that have an issue, and we have to fix that. And that is why they, uh, when uh, democracy fails in a country, there's always a culprit, uh, the, the military rulers, the strong men, and all like that come in. But uh, I think that, uh, again, we go back to the point, and I don't know if uh, uh, I can talk about the nexus between peace and democracy at this level. In fact, uh, we, I want to echo what our uh, uh, president was saying a moment ago about uh, their 
can no be, uh, be, be there can never be peace without democracy and vice versa and that is in the dna of the interparliamentary union when we were created 135 years ago our founding fathers said that you did not need to take up weapons to resolve disputes you had to sit at the table and dialogue and i think that value is still relevant today it has been enduring over the years and it is precisely uh, because of the point that you made, Thomas, that uh, democracies uh, uh, are not likely to go with war, uh, to war with one another. In the IPU, we realized that earlier on that if you promoted democracy and its values and its institutions, you are most likely to promote peace in the world. And that is what uh, brought us to have this uh, interconnectedness between peace, which was the original vision of the organization, and democracy, which we are prosecuting in a very robust manner today. Thank you, Martin. Just thinking, as we've heard about uh, this decline in democracy, and uh, Imran was talking about in his uh, sphere, this climate change in the democratic space and this disruption by the tech companies. And I'll come back to you in a moment, Imran, about this. I'm just wondering, Isabel, about whether you're seeing any new risks with the decline in in, in, in democracy and is one of those risks the, the spread of digital hate and disinformation? Um, yes, I think what we are seeing in general um, is um, that there's a, there's a moment that we're seeing over the last few years of radical uncertainty. And that, um, so how do um, leaders go about dealing with this um, uncertainty that it's brought about, as I mentioned, through all um, issues, uh, how to deal with crime and security, but also with new issues uh, such as technology. And I'm, I'm not going to refer to that since Imran is there, uh, it's here with us. But um, what we are seeing is that in many countries, this is a question of how to exert control. So in many countries, we are seeing uh, many attempts to restrict the rights of people. One of them is the repression that goes digital um, with, with much more force, but also um, the, the idea of a challenges to um, traditional representation um, as we have known it for the last century. So what we're seeing is these um, new challenges um, sort of give rise to um, different types of uh, repression depending on where we are, but also um, to put a more hopeful note, we are seeing also in many countries that in, the democratic institutions are playing a role in, in giving um, security and um, order to what is happening in many countries. So it's, um, I think it's a challenge and this challenge is especially acute with minority groups. When we go and look at the surveys that we did in different countries from around the world, we see that minorities feel um, a distance with what, what is going on or, or less access, for example, to justice or to the public forum with much more um, acuteness than um, non-minority groups. So I think there's new challenges that are related to, maybe not to wars, but to conflict and to this concept of radical uncertainty that is going on in different parts of the world as well. Uh, thank you, Isabel. And I think Imrani is a very good case study of uh, your organization and the concern about the tech companies that you've been outlining. I'm just wondering this amplification of disinformation. Do you see that this is a threat to peace or provoking violence? I mean, in short, yes, um, but let's talk about the mechanisms. And I think that, you know, we, we have a, a discussion about social media that is fairly events driven and it, it can be quite contingent on what's going on right now. For example, since the takeover of the platform known as Twitter by Elon Musk, a lot of energy has gone into talking about X and how it's a, a cesspit of hate speech, which is true. But let's not forget that the components of the information ecosystem, each platform plays a different role. So the granddaddy of social media platforms, Facebook, uh, which is used by, you know, old people like me, uh, because I don't, I, TikTok gives me a headache. Uh, 
Um, so um, Facebook is is a platform in which the drip drip of disinformation over time, algorithmically amplified by the, by the platform's decision making sort of internally, which says that the stuff that gets the most engagement should get should be amplified to the most people means that over time disinformation about people about groups is being spread disinformation lies and hate are inextricably interlinked and it's most clear when it comes to say anti-semitism so whether it's 2000 years ago with the blood libel it's in the 20th century with the um, protocols of the elders of zion which informed Hitler's ideology, or it's in the 21st century, the Great Replacement Theory that led to the massive loss of life in Christchurch of Muslims, in Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh of uh, Jewish people, and, you know, and has led to further violence around the world. A variant of it was the, the ideology that underpinned the murder of my colleague Joe um, in the UK. So lies and hate are inextricably interlinked. And what that does over time is create alternate people operating in alternate realities. This is in one respect, not just a threat to democracy, it's a threat to stable societies full stop. This is a Hobbesian challenge. This is about this, and for those of you who've read Thomas Hobbes, Leviathan, you know, this is the state of nature where you don't trust your neighbor. You've been told, you've been fed lies and lies and lies and lies and lies about the people in your community around you. Haitians in Springfield, Ohio, or, you know, Jewish people or Muslims or black people or whatever else. And eventually that has a destabilizing effect, inevitably. And, you know, I, in one respect, there's there's a bit of us that kind of wants to believe that we're more sophisticated than that. We're not. It's quite banal, but you spread enough lies about people and bad things happen. Indeed. And, uh, well, I was just reflecting. Um, I, I live in uh, Switzerland. I have Swiss nationality. But, of course, in Britain, there were the riots that uh, happened over the summer. And there was the role of social media, wasn't there, there in mobilizing the far right uh, 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 violence. So, uh, yeah. Uh, it's worth coming back to that because, look, what happened a few weeks ago in the UK was a uh, it, it was another you know, iceberg melting that should be telling us that something profound and dangerous is happening. And I worked very closely with the British police, the Home Office, the government there to respond to that and to work out what they could, how they could use the tools they had available through the new Online Safety Act to take action. Now, look, what happened there was uh, 11 young girls were stabbed in a town called Southport near where I grew up in Manchester, England. Um, three of the girls died. Um, immediately, a lie was spread on social media that it was a Muslim immigrant um, asylum seeker who just entered the country a few weeks ago. That led to the worst race riots that I can remember in the UK. Um, my, my, my family are Muslim. My mother, you know, she wears a scarf. Um, I was scared for her safety. It was and it was widespread across the entire country, all driven by one lie that was spread and amplified on the X platform and then was endorsed by the man that owns the X platform, Elon Musk, who said this is true. So he he then gave it further authority. And I think that is a really, really good example of, of, the, of the pace, not just of, of, of you know, we, we know that there is radicalization that occurs online. This is mobilization into real world violence. And I think the pace that this can happen, the fact that any, any you know, the actual truth, which is that it was not an asylum seeker, he was not a Muslim, the truth had no effect. These riots went on for days. And this shows the power of chronically disinformed communities being mobilized by a mechanism on which there is no challenge. There is no way of establishing the truth because this nonsensical idea that we can, you know, that through a mass debate between 4.5 billion people, we can find the truth. It is, of course, ludicrous given the patterns that, that decide who sees what are actually decided by the platforms and they specifically benefit disinformation and hate over good information and tolerance. Tom, you'd like to come in on that? Well, I think uh, this is a very acute observation on Imran's part and I think it's important to connect it to what Isabel was talking about in the increased disputation of elections. This is just one more area where lies uh, generate conflict. 
um, lies about elections are now propagated shamelessly, um, not just um, by ordinary people, but in some cases by political leaders. And this is just one more way in which uh, the distortion of reality in the online world is contributing to serious challenges for, for democracy. Well, let's try and move from the challenges to look at uh, ways that we might be able to uh, counter uh, some of these very troubling consequences and reinforce uh, uh, d democracy. Um, Tom, and I know that you've written about this, some people say that it's democracies that are failing to deliver, they need to improve their socio-economic performance, they need to offer food security and job security uh, to uh, people. Uh, is that the 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 answer that democracies need to deliver more with the onset of the democratic recession starting about 20 years ago people inevitably you know have searched for causes and one form of conventional wisdom that's been quite dominant uh, has been this idea that it's democracy's fault for failing to deliver. If you say that in any group of people discussing this sort of state of democracy in the world, heads will nod and people say, that's it. That's the problem. Democracies are not delivering. I think that has been true in some cases. Think of Brazil, for example, in the mid-2010s and the fecklessness of the Brazilian political elite, given all of the corruption there and the disgust of Brazilian voters for how Brazilian the Brazilian political elite on both sides was not delivering for the people, and that therefore they opted for an out-of-the-box or out-of-the-right-field uh, candidate, uh, Bolsonaro, who then started taking apart democracy. But in a lot of cases, it doesn't hold, and we need to be uh, more acute in our thinking about what's causing democratic decline. Think of Israel, for example, which is having paroxysms of democracy in recent years. Think of the massive protests against Netanyahu's proposed judicial reforms. The Israeli economy has been a marvel over the last 10 years. Israel is an incredibly successful country economically that is delivering economically for its people. That's not what's driving Israel's democratic problems. Or think of Poland, for example. Poland in the 2010s was the most successful country economically in Central Europe, but was a country which entered into a, ser a serious uh, process of democratic backsliding. So we have to be careful in just thinking that it's really the fault of economic shortcomings. Other things are at work. The polarization that I talked about, uh, new cultural, sociocultural forces like the right in Israel, the far right religious right, in Poland, illiberal forces on the right, new forces that are pushing uh, against established elites, much more complex picture. So what that means when we think about solutions, uh, Claire, is we have to think about, I, I argue very strongly in this article in the Journal of Democracy recently, Misunderstanding Democratic Backsliding, I argue that we really need to focus not so much on can democracies deliver, but can democracies constrain? Can they constrain the actors who are seeking to undercut democracy through things like strengthening judicial systems, reinforcing the integrity of electoral processes, reinforcing or creating some new integrity and in information spaces and so forth? So we need to think much more about constraining bad actors rather than blaming democracies and saying, if only you would deliver better, you'd be fine. Interesting. Um, Isabel, do you think that, do you agree with Tom's thesis there it's not about a failure of democracies delivering but we need to constrain the so-called uh, bad actors and i think one of the things that tom has just said of course is strengthening the courts yes i i want to um follow on tom's um comments on the courts because i think what we're seeing today is that this polarization that thomas has sort of um a put forth uh, in various of his comments is, is we're seeing it very clearly that it has moved into the battle to the courts, right? It used to be there, there's a great analysis on polarizations in the legislatures, but, but now we're seeing in different countries, and uh, for example, Israel, before the war started, Mexico are now to, to show two different countries that um, the courts are now part of this polarization for the, the, the actors, from the right and to the left. Uh, and, and I think this is crucial because we're seeing challenges to the judicial independence, to um, their, um, the enforcement, right? To the, to the basis of the rule of law. And, and courts are, are crucial um, 
and they play a pivotal role in what we were talking before, the peaceful resolution of conflict, but also of electoral disputes. We're seeing more and more um, elections that end up in court because of challenges to vote counting, to the um, uh, campaign system. And so the role of the courts is becoming um, part of the center stage now. And I think um, just to add one comment, uh, what we're seeing also in the perception of the democracy survey that we did in different countries around the world is that people are becoming more and more dis dissatisfied with courts. So access to justice, which, which is a different role, right? Which is uh, the relationship with the small claims that people bring, maybe in family law, maybe in civil matters, but how to access justice and the resolution of small conflicts is also being challenged in 18 out of 19 countries. So I think going back to the role of courts in democracy um, is pivotal to the um, discussion of democracy itself. And there's a very interesting development going on at the moment in Mexico, isn't there, about the independence of the judiciary, where they're putting forward this idea that there should be uh, elected uh, judges elected by the people as a true sign of democracy. But then there are a lot of concerns on the other side about that process and whether that would harm the independence of the judiciary. So it is a really live issue, Isabel. Yes, um, it has been approved uh, and became a law. This is a recent development from the last week and yesterday. Um, this is not the election of some judges. We have that system, for example, in the US, uh, for example, in Bolivia. This is the election of all federal judges, including the Supreme Court judges. Uh, so we will see massive elections next year and the year to come. Uh, and I think this is a, a huge challenge for the independence of courts uh, as we have conceived them, because they are going to be elected by the people. Uh, and I think this changes how we address uh, the independence, both within the judicial system, but more importantly, with the political actors and with the different actors themselves. Tom. On elected judges, just as a thought experiment, um, consider the fact that in the United States, we have a, you know, we do have a system of some judges are elected. And just imagine the following. A judge is campaigning for office. And what do people who campaign for office have to do? Well, they have to raise money. So picture judges going out and asking for campaign contributions from different businesses and wealthy actors and so forth. Then they get elected. To whom do they owe favors? The people who gave them the money. Is, does this make any sense democratically? I don't think so. So we need to be careful with a concept like democratizing the judiciary that's coming from, not from Isabel, but from the Mexican government, and think to ourselves very carefully, um, what does this really mean in practice? Thanks. Thank you, Tom. Imran, I mentioned at the beginning that I think that uh, the court threw out a lawsuit that Elon Musk uh, brought against your organization. So perhaps we could uh, argue that um, that was the courts uh, d performing their, their, their role. I don't know whether you have anything to say about that, but I just wanted to move the conversation on to uh, the role of regulation. Uh, you mentioned in your earlier comments about the Online Safety Act, and there is a number of measures that are, that are being taken. And to get your view on whether it's regulation that can really help uh, stop hate uh, speech and disinformation, these threats to democracy and peace? Um, look, I think that what regulation can do is, is I'm, 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 you know, from the political left, I used to serve the Labour Party as a special advisor in the UK many years ago. Um, I, I, I think governments should be very cautious about banning types of speech or, or, um, but what I think that they can do is enable a more informed discourse about the role that these platforms play. And the key to that is, first of all, transparency. So enforcing transparency on these companies, which is a good thing. So I talked at the very beginning about institutions without checks and balances within a democracy and how corrosive that can be, how dangerous they are, the competitive advantage that they receive. 
there's zero transparency. So how do we create transparency for the algorithms? How do we create transparency for their content enforcement policies? How do we create transparency on the advertising that, of course, the, uh, the advertising, 98% of their revenues are advertising. These are advertising platforms, not free speech platforms. They're about money. You know, Mark Zuckerberg is younger than I am. He's worth $100 billion. That's not free speech. That's really, really expensive speech. Really, really worth a lot of money to him. And so how do you how do you create that transparency that allows us to hold them meaningfully accountable and um, that that requires two things it requires transparent data and it requires people that can ask tough questions and can get good answers and that means a more informed regulators more informed lawmakers more informed select committees more informed civil society that can ask smart questions the third thing is that when they do negligently create harm, you should be able to hold them accountable, just like anyone else, right? We're all subject to negligence law. If I run a deli in Manhattan and I sell poisoned bagels, I'm going to get sued. I'm also probably going to get criminally prosecuted. So, you know, there, there are ways of holding people accountable. In the climate space, there are carbon taxes. There are ways of creating costs for the negative externalities of businesses and it's about doing that and having those available whether that's through litigation because of you know using tort law as in the us or it is through regulatory approach as there is in the uk and eu and australia and new zealand and south africa and growing around the world as well and i think that those that is the the fundamental components of a framework transparency accountability and responsibility is what we call our star framework because we believe that safety can only come with those three components in there and i mean you know all of that's available on our website counterhate.com we're actually relaunching with a, a a new a new version of the star framework in a few days time and i encourage everyone to have a look at it but I do think that beyond the technology, given that technology, you know, this is this is not just about technology. This is also about the impact it's had on our institutions. And we're now 20 years into an experiment of of forcing politicians to think this way, to think about negative partisanship campaigning in a certain way. And I do think that this is more spiritual than it is technological or even policy. This is about public service and about re and, you know, we need to re-emphasize and place renewed value on the fundamental characteristics and the honor of public service itself. The other day I spoke directly to someone who'd been who'd lost a lost a um, a race for mayor in a in a small town in America because of an AI generated disinformation package about him. And you know, all I had to say, all all I had to say to him was, "I'm sorry." And what you did, which is to run for office, is possibly the most honourable thing you can do. To seek to represent your people, to seek to better the lives of your community and your nation, that is a really honourable thing to do. And I think that it's that that once we've sorted out the fact that negativity is is has been so valuable for twenty years economically for the producers and the distributors of that negative, that 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 hate and disinformation, we're also going to have to do some renewal of the value of democracy itself because those values are are under threat as well. Uh, thank you, Imran. And uh, Martin is nodding next to me about that because uh, obviously that is uh, one of the main functions of the IPU is to uh, encourage young people to enter uh, public service uh, to become parliamentarians. Um, the IPU has also got a role in regulation. We we saw that Imran uh, was talking about that, and we know that uh, Brussels, the Brussels effect, tends to be regulation, uh, the US uh, tends to be financial incentives or disincentives. But Martin, just tell us a little bit about the role of the IPU on regulation, because you've got something coming up, haven't you, at your assembly in October? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Claire. I think that, first of all, we have to be careful uh, that uh, uh, we do not cross that fine line between regulation and restriction because some countries, especially in the less democratic environments, uh, people might tend to think that regulation means restricting, banning, but that's not the case. The case is to fight, strike a good balance. Yes, the IPU is very active in helping parliaments minimize the uh, negative effects of artificial intelligence that is used, for example, to create uh, hate speech and to uh, maximize uh, the benefits thereof. So uh, coming up, you mentioned uh, uh, next month, 
we're going to have our assembly, general assembly here in Geneva, that is going to have as its overarching uh, theme, science, technology, and innovation for a more peaceful and sustainable society or future, which means that parliaments will have an opportunity to compare notes on what is happening around the world and seek solutions to the challenges that are being faced. There, I also want to mention that uh, we have been working over the past several years on a charter, a charter of ethics for science and innovation. And that uh, charter is going to be adopted by the overall membership of the organization. It lays emphasis on the need to reinvigorate the values and moral concepts that should uh, be prevalent in the new uh, technological environment that we have uh, today. And parliaments have an important role to play. Then we also have, during this assembly, a resolution on AI and democracy, human rights, and rule of law. So parliaments are working to see how they can legislate in a very useful manner to harness the potential of these new technologies for the benefit of uh, constituents and minimizing uh, the, uh, I would say, the, the risks that are involved. So we, we will continue to work on this. And uh, of course, the issue of the harmful effects of artificial intelligence to democratic institutions is one that we have to address very robustly. And we hope that this can come out very clearly in the resolution that the IP is going to pass, which is going to be a blueprint for the global parliamentary community. Uh, thank you, Martin. And we're going to hear from some parliamentarians who've been involved and in contributing to those resolutions. Let me just bring to a conclusion this part of the discussion. This event, of course, is bridging World Democracy Day and World Peace Day. And we heard from Isabel about the Global Status of Democracy uh, report. The IPU is today launching a toolkit for parliamentarians on peace and security. So a short video to tell you about this and Martin will give you a few of the highlights. You can download that toolkit, but let's get a little bit of an executive summary, or not really an executive summary, Martin. Just give us a few highlights, and I think we are talking highlights here and not lowlights, um, <laughs> about the innovative approaches that you are suggesting in this toolkit. Yeah, I think that this uh, toolkit is born out of real realization that the current concept of security uh, which means the, uh, the security of an institution that, or rather an entity that is abstract is not very beneficial for the human being. You know, when we talk about security, we're talking the, uh, about the security of a state or a country. But what we want is the security of the individual and a common vision of how we can secure the, excuse the technology, uh, the security of the individual. So for us, as you saw in that video, this requires a paradigm shift from this state concept of security to one where we are talking about uh, protection 
of uh, the interests of the individual as opposed to repression or the confrontational approach that uh, is too often used when it uh, comes to uh, uh, discussing uh, security. But then also we want parliaments to be robust in embracing this uh, new approach through uh, legislation at the national level, but also at the international level. We would like the uh, notion that the uh, security of one country can reinforce the security of the others, which is something that needs to be taken into account. And you cannot think that you want to secure yourself to the exclusion of uh, other uh, countries. So the key notions of mutual trust, disarmament need to be articulated more strongly. And of course, uh, democracy comes in there. I think that is the subject of this discussion here, that we need to promote the core values of democracy and the way they are implemented in order to have a situation whereby the people feel secure and their well-being is delivered upon. Thank you very much, Martin, for that. And we're getting some questions in from the parliamentarians and the people in the audience uh, for our panel. And I'll direct them to our panel in a moment. But first of all, I'd just like to follow up on that toolkit and the resolution, because, of course, everything the IPU does is a collaboration. And we have some parliamentarians who are going to talk about the collaboration on that toolkit and on the resolution. They're going to speak for about two minutes. And if I can go first to Mr. Ali I. Nuami, a parliamentarian from the United Arab Emirates, who's also the vice president of the IPU Executive Committee. Hello, sir. Delighted to see you in vision. Um, you. Please, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's very important to emphasize the principles that the IPU is there for to serve parliamentarian and also to serve the world at the end. And here I'd like to, you know, be realistic about how can we approach uh, building democracy, uh, creating peace for different regions in the world. There is no one size fit all. And this is where it's very important, especially our friends in the West. They have to understand that when it's come to peace, to democracy, to development, there is different player uh, in the West than those in uh, Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, Latin America. And this is where we have to look into all those players and engage with them and be patient in educating them and showing first you know, acknowledgement of their role, respect uh, for what they can do and provide us to the societies. And also, you know, that they have followers. And here I, would, I want to emphasize the, the role of the religious leaders. Uh, you know, last month I was visiting a country, they had an election. And when I met many politicians, I, I asked the question, how do you see the, the impact of the religious leaders? And the answer was from many, from the, you know, the, the winner side and the loser side. For the they said, look, 60% of politicians here, they, you know, they are uh, following what the religious leaders in the country are saying. So it's very important to understand that they have a role to play. If we don't engage them, they will do things that will undermine peace and security and democracy. And this is where we have to engage with them in a dialogue, show them how can they play a, a very positive role and engage with them and others actually. And also with a different uh, perspective, in many countries there is tribe leaders who have more power and you know, influence on the people, on the local community uh, than the president or the prime minister. Uh, and or you know other politicians. So, for example, myself being an expert in countering terrorism and extremism, I see a reason for the failure in the Sahel and Somalia and other places because we didn't engage religious leaders, we didn't engage tribe leaders, and this is where we have to have a general perspective, uh, being inclusive in building peace for all society. And here I want you know, to emphasize the, 
the, the, uh, the importance of the role of the IPU, especially when it's come to the mediation between uh, you know, Russia and Ukraine, creating the task force I, I chair. And I'd like to thank member of the task force for their commitment, for their patience, for their dedication, actually, to help create peace uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that point about, indeed, engaging religious interfaith leaders and having this inclusive approach. And indeed, I'm sure everybody on the call uh, does hope that there is going to be some form of peace that comes out of that conflict in Russia and Ukraine. Uh, thank you very, very much. I understand also that on the call we have Mr. Issa Mado, a parliamentarian from Chad. And if Mr. Mado is on the call, Super, I can see you, sir, and I understand you'll be speaking in French. The floor is yours. Uh, merci beaucoup et bonjour à tout le monde. Uh, je voudrais uh, uh, saluer uh, les organisateurs pour uh, l'organisation uh, de cette rencontre qui est quand même importante et qui vient à point nommé. Euh, je voudrais euh, dire euh, ceci par rapport à la thématique, les crises au Tchad, comme dans la plupart des pays du bassin du lac de l'insécurité. Et donc, euh, ceci a de bien having... avec... Euh, on a un petit problème avec la ligne, monsieur. Je, je ne sais pas sociale. si on peut continuer avec la ligne. Euh, ces fractures et angoisses recouvrent des inégalités graves et secrètes, des frustrations susceptibles de tracer des clivages sociaux par la pauvreté et à la fois violence. Et humiliation. La paix, la paix ne peut s'accommoder à des. Monsieur, excusez-moi, désolé, mais la ligne est vraiment mauvaise. Alors, effectivement, je vais passer la parole à quelqu'un d'autre. Vous m'entendez? Um, I'm, so, I'm so sorry, but the line, vous, the vous line is just... No, the line is too bad, and I'm being told that we have to move on. We'll êtes... see whether we can reconnect later. Vous we, it was breaking up. Vous we can hear you, but it breaks up, so we cannot understand what you're saying. If I could move the conversation to Aigul Kuspan, a parliamentarian from Kazakhstan, who's also the president of the IPU Standing Committee on Peace and International Security. And Ms. Kuspan will be speaking in French. Oui, merci beaucoup. Euh, tout d'abord, je voudrais remercier euh, les auteurs de l'outil euh, parce que c'est un vrai outil euh, concis, bien structuré, très synthétique, avec des idées très claires. On a bien envie d'y revenir, de le relire, euh, d'y puiser de nouvelles idées. Donc, je vous remercie pour euh, d'avoir préparé cette publication. Je voudrais aussi euh, remercier le secrétaire général notre madame la modératrice d'avoir organisé cette discussion qui est très intéressante et très, euh, très instructive aussi. Euh, je dois partager mon sentiment. Je me disais ces derniers temps, mais qu'est-ce qui arrive à, à mon peuple, au peuple kazakh Parce que quand j'ouvre le Facebook, quand j'ouvre ces, toutes ces plateformes, tous ces réseaux sociaux, je vois des flots de... De, de haine, de critique, de scepticisme. Alors, d'une part, aujourd'hui, en vous écoutant, je me, en écoutant surtout M. Imran Ahmed, d'une part, je suis soulagée, parce que ce n'est pas seulement au Kazakhstan, mais d'autre part, euh, part euh, je suis, de notre côté, je suis vraiment très inquiète, parce que je me dis, où est-ce que nous allons euh, j'ai une question à poser aux auteurs. Euh, je pense qu'elle sera adressée à M. Thomas Caroters, euh, 
inutile. La publication dit qu'il faut privilégier le financement des services publics aux dépenses militaires, qu'il faut réaffecter les dépenses militaires aux programmes sociaux pour réduire les inégalités, pour encourager la justice sociale. Pourtant, qu'est-ce que nous voyons Nous voyons que les gouvernements les plus démocratiques et les plus développés, les plus riches, euh, augmentent constamment leur budget militaire. Euh, Tandis que, ce que je peux constater aussi, qu'un fin financement insuffisant des forces armées, de l'armée, des... de... se traduit toujours par une diminution de revenus du personnel militaire, par une mauvaise formation militaire, par une diminution de, du prestige euh, du service militaire. Et finalement, par un mécontentement et voire des troubles au sein des, de l'armée. Voilà, donc ma question est la suivante. Est-ce qu'on peut demander aux parlementaires de diminuer le budget de l'armée quand on sait que les pays développés, d'une part, l'augmentent constamment et que les militaires, qui ne peuvent pas subvenir aux simples besoins de leur famille, peuvent eux aussi devenir un facteur d'instabilité Voilà, merci beaucoup. Well, thank you very, very much for your comment. And also that question for Tom Carruthers, which if I simplify, it seems to be that you're asking why are the most democratic countries rearming when budgets should be going to feed and educate and care for, for people? Tom was listening. Tom speaks very good French. So I let Tom uh, answer your question, Ms. Kuspan. Yes, thanks for the question. Um, it's true that uh, Western democratic governments have in recent years started increasing their military spending in Europe, for example. Uh, this is largely in response to the Russia-Ukraine war and a sense of perceived increasing threat um, from Russia. But we have to keep the increases in perspective. Most European governments spend, you know, around 2% of their budget on the military, which you know, isn't really actually all that much. And so it isn't as though these governments have extremely high levels relative to their budgets of military spending. If anything, they've been very low over the last 30 years and they're starting to increase them somewhat. So I think the IPU's call to make sure, the parliaments around the world to make sure that their, their budgets are balanced in a way that's really gives priority to human security is, is the right approach. Um, there are a number of developed countries uh, that are increasing spending for particular security reasons, but there are many developing countries where military spending is is not in proportion to the you know spending on human security. Thank you very much for your answer, Tom. I'd like to bring in another parliamentarian, a parliamentarian from Ireland, Dennis Norton, who's also the chairperson of the IPU Working Group on Science and Technology. And I understand, uh, Mr. Norton, you've been very involved in this resolution on artificial intelligence. The floor is yours. Thanks, uh, Madam Chair. And uh, maybe to talk a bit about this concept of human security, because for me, I think it offers a unique perspective on, on problem solving. As members of parliaments, we face daily issues daily, whether it's uh, individuals trying to address their housing uh, challenges to complex issues like regulating uh, artificial intelligence. And I think what human security does, it is encouraging us to place individuals at the center uh, of uh, the problem solving approach, a practice that comes naturally to us uh, as politicians. However, because of the relentless pace that we have in politics on a day to day basis, it can cause us to lose sight of this vital perspective. And I believe that human security provides a universal tool to assess uh, the effectiveness of our solutions and our policy proposals. It's about prioritizing people's well-being and placing people at the center uh, of decisions, including minorities, as uh, Isabel pointed out earlier. It's like assembling an, a mosaic where each piece represents a different dimension uh, of life. And only by fitting those pieces together thoughtfully can we see the full picture. As a result, we can develop better, 
more equitable solutions grounded in real life situations. And taking that a step further, I think the toolkit that we're publishing here uh, is, is something that can actually really develop this concept. And one of the 10 uh, recommendations to promote peace in it focuses on the issue of cyberspace and the digital world. And of course, that's a huge global challenge that we have today. This toolkit, I think, aligns very well with uh, our working group's ethical charter on science and technology, which will be adopted at the assembly in Geneva uh, in October, something that was referenced by Martin earlier. It was interesting in Imran's presentation, he highlighted the need for ethical governance uh, in, in cyber, cyberspace. And it's crucial that we establish ethical principles for digital technology governance, which are outlined in our charter. This ensures that technological advancements, including artificial intelligence, are developed with a human-centric approach, benefiting everyone and fostering public trust by prioritizing global well-being, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. The Charter calls for a risk assessment and management of new technologies to address evolving threats and vulnerabilities uh, referenced by, by Thomas earlier, particularly in the digital world. It also champions international cooperation to promote responsible behaviour in cyberspace, resulting in global collaboration on cybercrime and fostering partnerships between law enforcement agencies to address cyber threats effectively. And I look forward uh, at our assembly next month in having this a charter adopted and seeing how we can develop this whole concept of human security uh, to benefit all of our citizens on this planet. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Norton. Uh, before I conclude this very special event, uh, there's a question that's come in over the Zoom, which Imran, I thought you might like to have a go at. It says, um, how can the voice of democracy compete with the voice of disinformation and propaganda um, that sometimes these despotic regimes present themselves as benevolent. They're master manipulators. So how can the voice of democracy compete? Well, well, well look, I think that generally speaking over time, given that we're speaking to audiences of the public, the public have, have preferred democracy over oppression, autocracy and the question is whether or not that message the messages are operating on a symmetric playing field and um, what we have now is a deeply asymmetric playing field in which disinformation and hate are given algorithmic advantage because of the engagement they generate making them more prevalent you know making them more seem more common um, something called the illusory truth effect in our psychology. If we see something frequently, we think it's more likely to be true. So when you see again and again and again anti-democratic, hateful messaging, it starts to shift the perceptions of normality of the society around you. And I don't, and again, going back to, I don't think we should be banning kinds of speech. People, there are always people that hold these repugnant views in society. They're repugnant. If I started swearing and, you know, using racial slurs right now, you'd kick me off the Zoom. If if I did it in my local pub, I'd be kicked out. If I did it on the street, someone would come up to me and say, what on earth do you think you're saying? But on social media, you're given not just algorithmic advantage, you can be economically rewarded for it thanks to revenue sharing. And I think it is about creating transparency so that we can come to moral judgments based on the facts. Right now, they hide behind a technological veil of opacity about the ways in which they administer the systems that we have voluntarily abrogated, you know, and given over to them, the, the public, the, the, the realm of public discourse. And I think that with transparency, what we can create is a meaningful discourse about whether or not the way that they operate their platforms are aligned with the public good and with the values, the fundamental values that underpin our society. And I think very quickly we'll find that they change the way that they behave. And that's both by using, you know, taught 
for where there's genuine human harm, but also by speaking to the market and having that use its powerful voice as 98% of the revenues of these companies to try and realign them with the moral imperatives that underpin our democracy. Thank you very much, Imran, for that. I'm going to conclude by asking each of our panellists a question, and I'll ask them to keep their answers short. Uh, you have got a captive audience of parliamentarians, uh, people who can keep the executive uh, to account, uh, people who can legislate. Um, so, Isabel, what sort of support would you like from parliamentarians uh, for your work in uh, reinforcing democracy? I'll ask the same question to Thomas and Imran, and then we'll conclude with Martin. Isabel. Thank you, Claire. I'm gonna bring it back to, to where I started. I think because of what we're seeing in terms of challenges to the elections, the whole election process, I think it's, it's crucial for parliamentarians to strengthen and reinforce the role of electoral management bodies. They have different forms and designs in each country, but I think, for example, what we're seeing is that the timing to do electoral reforms is crucial uh, and to have a widespread agreement on these electoral reforms and not go about with a few votes here and a few votes there that then can polarize the whole election process. I think the engagement and the perception of civil society, uh, the academia, researchers and the media on elections is crucial for um, bringing together a whole community that can strengthen the whole election process. And again, um, regulations uh, for elections go beyond vote counting. They have to do with the whole electoral processes from the establish of the electoral management bodies. And I think this is an area where we have to, again, put a focus and um, because it's crucial for democracy. Tom, what would uh, you like parliamentarians to be doing? Claire, I would highlight the potential role of parliaments in reducing polarization. Given their multi-party character, parliaments are more naturally an arena for overcoming polarization than executive branches or judiciaries. They're by nature the arena for contestation, civil contestation between uh, parties who disagree with each other. So I'd ask every parliamentarian to think about um, how serious polarization is this a problem in today's world? What are some of its causes and what role, even in a small way, they can play in building a bridge to another side, engaging in rational discourse, accepting the nature of opposition and so forth. So parliaments have a critical role to play in reducing polarization. Imran. Um, well, beyond increasing the amount of free childcare available, which I would really, really appreciate right now. Um, so look, I think there are, yes, I've talked about transparency. I've talked about, you know, things that, 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 that legislatures can do. And I really, really encourage you to think about the proposals in our staff framework on our website, counterhate.com and whether or not they would work for your jurisdiction. We're happy to work with you on that. But the second thing I think is more important, which is that right now, we have a rapidly devolving um, spaces in which public discourse and political discourse occurs. And I do think that we are at the point of um, needing a non-proliferation agreement between political parties in each country on things like AI, the use of generative AI, on how we campaign and the rules that we, that we agree to abide by. We are still people that believe in the rule of law. We believe in, in, in the common good. And in order to secure the common good and the rule of law, I think it is vital that we agree not to use technologies that fundamentally further, and in fact, transformatively undermine our confidence in democracy, facts, truth, science, and things like generative AI. So a nuclear non-proliferation treaty for AI, I think, would be something that each country could adopt, the political parties, and would be a sign that we are willing to voluntarily secure truth at the expense, perhaps, of partisan advantage. 
Thank you very much, Imran. Martin, lots of ideas uh, there from the uh, nuclear non-proliferation agreement on AI and, of course, uh, reducing polarization. Your thoughts. Let me give you the final word. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I think that Parliament, uh, uh, I, I might be, um, I might be uh, lacking in uh, objectivity here. Parliaments are the most representative governing institutions in our countries, and they are challenged to reflect the general interest. They should, in their policies and other actions, mirror the interests of society, which means that uh, parliaments have a big responsibility in making democracy deliver for the people using those powers that are uh, accrue to them uh, by the uh, constitutions that uh, govern our countries, lawmaking, holding government to account, allocating resources. I think I had a lot set, being said here about uh, allocating more resources to uh, uh, health, education, and less to military spending. I think parliaments need to act in the overall interest of the people. And uh, the the we, we talk about uh, leaving no one behind. And parliaments are the institution in our countries that can ensure that no one is left behind. And lastly, I want to uh, underscore the point that parliaments have a responsibility to restore the legitimacy of democracy and democratic processes around the world by living up to the expectations of the people. And in the area of peace, I think we've all heard that building a prosperous society, a more developed society, more equitable society, tends to lead to greater peace and harmony in society and between countries. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Martin, and thank you to our other speakers for their eloquence and for their very substantive ideas on peace and democracy and how democracy can be reinforced in these troubled times. All of the materials that were mentioned by the IPU can be found on the IPU website, ipu.org. You have the details of the different organizations that the speakers are from, whether it's the STAR framework, whether it's POMS, many really thoughtful articles, and of course, Isabel's organization, uh, the International Idea Global Status of Democracy report that comes out today. Please don't forget forget to follow and tag IPU. Uh, sometimes social media could be useful. So please do go on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, YouTube, and even X uh, to promote uh, the de democratic message and the importance of parliament. And as the president of the IPU said in her opening remarks, happy international days of democracy and peace. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us.